Uh, my name is Miguel Villas Boas. I'm a professor in the marketing group here at the uh, High School of Business. Uh, Dean Lyons, uh, unfortunately, could not be here today. He had a board meeting conflict. And so it's an honor for me to fill in and introduce our uh, esteemed speaker and dear friend and old friend from the school. Uh, so this talk is sponsor jointly sponsored by the Dean Speaker Series and by the David Acker Distinguished Lecture Series in Marketing. Um, and so it's a great pleasure to welcome back to us uh, David uh, Hacker, a colleague from uh, many years and from whom I learned so much through the years. So uh, David retired a few years ago after a, a full uh, long and productive career uh, here and then went to uh, profit, but we didn't uh, want to lose uh, his uh, teachings here, and so we instituted this uh, David Acker Distinguished series, Lecture Series in Marketing. Uh, so David uh, returns to us uh, every year to, to tell us about uh, the new learning, the new developments uh, from his research. He has over 100 articles, over 15 books published. Uh, this is the last book, Hacker on Branding. So as uh, the whole best 20 principles in branding. And so not slowing down in any way. And, uh, and, and he's uh, the world expert in branding in, in the world. And so we are very lucky to have him as one of our own. Uh, is very well, uh, is uh, Acker brand uh, identity model is used uh, worldwide. He's in the Marketing Hall of Fame in the, by the American Marketing Association. And, uh, and uh, is uh, acting on <coughs> now on uh, a lot of these principles in the real world as vice chairman of uh, profit brand strategies. And so today, uh, Dave is going to talk about the power of brand uh, personality. And so we'll, we'll learn, uh, I'm sure we'll learn a lot as, 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 as always. So uh, without further comment, please join me in uh, welcoming Professor David Acker to be back to us. Thanks, Miguel. Yeah, but Miguel and I go way back. I, I used to give him a hard time, but now he's, he's got me away. He doesn't have to worry about that. Um, uh, so I'm talking about brand personality. What's the worst thing you can say about a person? That he has no personality, right? That means you don't want to be around him. He's not interesting. It's better to be a jerk. <laughs> and um, it's true with brands too. If a brand has a personality, that means that brand is probably more visible, more interesting, somebody you want to connect with. Um, it's probably be more likely to be on brand in terms of messaging. And um, so it's, it's, it's really good if you can develop or strengthen a brand personality. So I'm going to talk about brand personality, but before I do, I want to tell you a story that sort of uh, talks about why we have brand personality and what are the theoretical underpinnings of it. So brand personality basically is, the, uh, is what you get if you ask, if this brand was a person, what would it be? Now it turns out that people can do that easily. They can uh, give person characteristics to their pet dog, to their car, to their vacation home, and uh, it's not a problem. And they can do it with brands. And, uh, and we know that, and we've done it, and so on to the story. The story starts with Sigmund Freud, who spent 80 years in Vienna, Austria, developing this enormous theory of motivation and personality. And uh, one of the giants of psychology, you know, the id, the ego, the superego, and, and on and on and on and on. It was a very 
detailed in, in um, uh, theory uh, had had a lot to do with uh, the fact that sex pretty much explains everything. But um, uh, anyway, 1938, the Nazis invaded Vienna and he went to England where he died a couple years later. There's two things about his theory that uh, are important for our discussion of brand personality. The first is, he said, the mind is like an iceberg. It floats with one-seventh of its block, bulk above water. So the mind, seven-eighths of the mind is below. Um, and, and other people say two-thirds is other percentages, but uh, a lot of it is below the surface. It's subconscious. And so therefore, you don't ask people, you know, what, uh, why did you buy or use that brand? Because they don't know. It's, it's, it's part of their subconscious. Second thing is the methodology he used. It was very focused on depth interviews, where you indirectly find out about this subconscious, and things like projection, free association, sentence completion. And those are the techniques we use to study uh, brand personality. A student, not a student of his, he, uh, Ernest Dichter studied, well, lived for 31 years in Vienna, Austria, and he studied under uh, a couple of, of colleagues of Freud, and these are people that broke off from Freud. Freud was very rigid, and, and you, uh, you did everything his way, or else you were, uh, you were separated. And so he, he, he uh, studied on a couple colleagues, Alfred Adler was one of them, in Vienna. And then when the Nazis came in 1938, he was 31 years old, and he moved to New York. And in New York in 1938, he started uh, helping companies design better marketing programs. One of his first clients was Plymouth. And around 1940, he famously uh, found out that this Plymouth that wasn't selling, he, he, he discovered the insight that the personality of the Plymouth convertible was a young male, free to do what he wants, and has a secret mistress on the side. And so what he recommended was that to be more attractive, they should put the convertible in the ads, and they should put the convertible in the showrooms, even though only 2% of the people bought convertibles. And so that's what they did, and sales really took off. And now when, they, the, when people got to the showroom, they didn't buy the convertible. They bought the sedan, whose personality was um, you know, more mature, more stable, and had a solid wife with a good relationship. Um, and a couple of others of his, uh, his clients was uh, the prune business, and he said the personality of a prune is that of a dried up old spinster. The prune business, and he said the personality of a prune is that of a dried up old spinster. <laughs> and what you want to do is, uh, is talk about fruit and plums and so on, and so he got all the, these, the Del Monte prune brand to show pictures of, of plump uh, fruit instead of dried up shriveled prunes. Um, and another one of his famous um, clients was, was Betty Crocker. Betty Crocker developed an incredible breakthrough. They developed a cake mix that all you had to do was add water. And it was a terrific cake. And it would talk about saving time and saving energy for busy housewives. It, this was a real breakthrough. But it didn't sell. It just failed in the marketplace. So they turned to Ernest Dichter, who told them that, well, he did about 100 uh, depth interviews, as he did with Plymouth, and he, he found out that women really like the feeling that comes with baking a, a cake. They feel like uh, great housewives and uh, good mothers and good wives and, and accomplished in the kitchen, 
And they felt guilty when they were using just water. They felt guilty and they also were a little suspicious of the result. So we said, why don't you add a couple eggs into the cake mix? And then you, you adjust the cake mix to accommodate that. And, um, and, and he said, not only will they now feel like they're actually cooking something, and they'll get that same rewards that they would get uh, before, but also there's something like, uh, th th they'll get the feeling of giving birth and giving their, you know, uh, giving another child to their husband and family. Um, and uh, so the, the personality changed abruptly of this cake mix to something, a nurturing, creative, admired baker. Now, during this time, Ernest Dichter talked again and again about people don't buy attributes. They're not rational. What they do is they buy the gestalt. They buy the brand personality. That's the term he used, brand personality. And he said, consumers look to brands whose personality helps us express our ideal self-image. And that was really the... Um, the underpinnings of, of brand personality. So he kind of ruled the rule. I mean, Time Magazine wrote an article about Ernest Dichter two years after he arrived in the United States. His, his ideas were so uh, incredible. And they held the day for almost 25 years until they fell off the cliff in about 1965. Um, and what happened was three things. First of all, Motivation research was perceived as being too effective. There was a, a book called The Hidden Persuaders by Vance Packard that argued that this motivation, the stuff of Dichter, was manipulative. Got people to buy stuff they didn't need, even didn't want. It was kind of Orwellian. There was a subliminal advertising. They were sneaking things in you didn't know about that would change everything. Well, it turned out that wasn't very um, true. But anyway, that, uh, they didn't know that at the time, and so Dichter got slammed from that side. But he was also, ironically, slammed from another side from people that saying it's, it's just not valid, it's junk. So too effective, to, it's just junk. And um, because you have two motivation researchers looking at the same situation, they come to different opinions. It's not very reliable, right? And he would come out with these weird, weird recommendations. Like, for example, he told uh, Pepsi-Cola, don't show, uh, when you have a glass of Pepsi, don't show it with ice in it, because ice means death. And they kind of threw him out the room. That's, that's, that's crazy. And uh, so uh, he fell out of disfavor, and he kind of left left the field for the next 15 years. He really was on the periphery after being mainstream for so long. Um, and the other thing that happened was, uh, I call it the first big deer data era, probably the second, actually. Um, it was developed by uh, Bill Wells. Do you remember Bill Wells of uh, Needham? He, he developed something called lifestyle research. So now you could look at the subconscious and do it quantitatively. You ask all these lifestyle questions to a whole bunch of people, you know, what do you like? Do you like to play tennis? Do you, uh, you know, what are your activities that you do and, and so on? What's your lifestyle? And that would give you a picture of the subconscious and you could, it's quantitative. You could say 23% of the people do this way and 28% of the people are that way. So it was quantitative. Big sigh of relief, right? It's none of this uh, hocus pocus. And so that was, um, uh, you know, another nail in the coffin of motivation research. So motivation research uh, sort of disappeared for quite a while. But maybe 15, 20 years ago, it came back. And brand personality is back. A couple of things happen. One is behavioral economics happen. Danny Kahneman, Danny Ariely, and those guys, and, and uh, um, 
they, they proved that customers are not rational. They proved it in experiment after experiment after experiment. Customers are not rational. And the second thing that happened is anthropological research became extremely powerful, led by Procter and Gamble. And people started living in people's homes or putting cameras there and observing them instead of asking them, you know, why did you buy this brand? And, um, and there's a whole uh, an academic uh, uh, consumer behavior, the whole branch started studying things about 20 or 25 years ago called postmodern consumer behavior. And they were studying using anthropological techniques. And then this, the power of emotional connection, connection came to the fore. And now we're studying that with brainwave research. It's, it's almost mainstream marketing. So brand personality is back. So what, why would we want to um, go to the trouble of trying to figure out a brand personality and then create one? Well, uh, there's, let me give you a few reasons. First of all, a brand personality is a way to represent self-expressive benefits. Look at a Prius, for example. Prius, it, because of its ability to reduce emissions, it's one of the cleanest cars there, and, and, and more importantly, known for that. And it gets great my, gas mileage, so it doesn't burn or use much gasoline. Um, so what that means, if if, uh, if the personality of Prius is somebody that cares about the environment and is going to do something about it. And, and because of that, it delivers a self-expressive benefit. So if you are that kind of a person, then driving a Prius means a lot to you it gives you a lot of self-expressive benefit. It gives you a lot of social benefits because you are announcing to the world that you're that kind of guy. And, uh, and it's got a very unique design. And you compare it to the Ford Fusion, for example, which is, which is probably equally as good. But if you see a Ford Fusion, it looks like a million other cars. And even, even worse, there's a hybrid model and there's a gas model and if you're driving down the street they don't know that you're one of the environmental good guys but if you're driving a Prius they do because it's only a hybrid Prius uh, you know one of my things is the only way to grow is to develop must-haves uh, to find new subcategories and then compete at the subcategory level and uh, uh, those ideas are in my book, Brand Relevance, and also in this summarized in this book, Ocker and Branding. Um, but Prius is really a great example. In 1990, they came out with Prius. I mean, 2000, they came out with Prius globally, and they have had no competition for literally 16 years. Today, they own 65% of the world market. 65% today, 16 years later. They've sold three and a half million cars. They've sold one and a half million of those in the U.S. with very little competition. Um, and the reason they've done that is because, not because of, of the, the, you know, the attributes of the car, because others have duplicated those virtually, but because of the self-expressive benefits that that brand has delivered. And a way to get there is thinking about brand personality. Second. It gives you a basis for a personal relationship with a customer. So um, uh, you think about um, the um, a, a kind of relationship we have within people. Well, the brand personality construct gets you into thinking about what's a relationship between a brand and a person, because a, a brand personality means we think of a brand as a person. So it could be like a family member, um, Hallmark and Hershey's. So somebody you're comfortable with, somebody you respect, um, and, and just being comfortable is real powerful. Inspiring leader, uh, IBM, Wall Street Journal, and leadership is another really powerful 
characteristic of a brand because um, you know you ascribe all sorts of good things to a leader. Um, a mentor, Mayo Clinic and Vanguard means you look to them to, to advice and they're interested in you, right? And how important is that to have a brand that's really interested in you? Uh, stimulating companion like uh, uh, Das Equus, or however you pronounce it, the most interesting man, uh, remember that? Uh, that's a little, uh, maybe too direct, but a stimulating person will be somebody that's funny, that's interesting, that's fun to be with. And then a shared interest, maybe in the outdoors, for example, gives you a reason to connect to Patagonia and Ariane. And uh, when you start thinking about relationships between brands and, and customers, like between people, then you, uh, you, you get a little insight into alternative ways to find out what they think of you. So you can say, instead of saying, what do you think of this card brand, credit card brand, you could say, if this brand were a person, what would it say to you? Suppose it said, my job is to help you get accepted. You have good taste. That suggests a sophisticated, educated, confident, world traveler brand personality. But if they said, I am successful and can do what I want, if I were going to dinner, I would not include you, that's a brand that is likely to be considered snobbish, aloof, condescending. So we really do research just like that. And we get insights just like that. Because you find out some really bad things you couldn't find out by just doing a, some kind of image survey. But a brand personality can still, it can actually represent functional benefits as well. Uh, if you think Harley Davidson, it's, it's got this, uh, this macho, freedom of the road, power, you know, let's, you know, let's drive across country. And that sort of exudes power and strength and, um, and noise and so on. All the things that, that um, attract you, all the functional things that, are, are, that you want in such a product. You think about uh, MetLife. I mean, this is an insurance company, right? Insurance companies are, are brands that you never want to see or talk about, first of all. And second of all, you know in your heart that they've got cold hearts and they live in a building with a guard out in front to protect them from, from talking, ever talking to you. But if you, you know, 1985, they put the Snoopy characters around that life, it makes them a little more warm and approachable, doesn't it? And now if you, if you went out and told people, you know, we're warm and approachable, yeah, sure. That's not very credible. But if you put the Snoopy characters, nobody's going to counter-argue. Nobody's going to be suspicious. I mean, it's Snoopy characters, right? <laughs> and they are lovable, warm, and approachable. It guides and suggests marketing programs. So if you, if you uh, tailor-made golf equipment, if you say it's high quality with innovative design, I mean, what company is not delivering high quality with innovative design? I mean, it gives you no guidance, right? But if you say a demanding professional, TaylorMade is a demanding professional, now suddenly you've got a little more texture. The brand personality. And Bath and Body Works has a, uh, created a customer called Kate, very specific. 32 years old, two kids, healthy lifestyle, wholesome Midwestern values, University, Miami University of Ohio. So when they make a decision at Bath and Body Works, would Kate like, would Kate like it? Would Kate approve of this? What, how would Kate feel about it? And that helps them make decisions. So it's putting a brand personality on the brand and, and thinking and filtering your decisions through that personality. 
Okay, what do we know about brand personality? I mean, how, what does a brand personality consist of? Well, uh, in, uh, in 90, 1997, my daughter actually, Jennifer Ocker, uh, for the first time created a, a really well accepted set of scales around brand personality. And what she did is she rated six very disparate brands on 114 personality phrases, and she generated the big five dimensions, brand personality. So these are dimensions that if you look at the strong personality brands across all kinds of products, these dimensions tend to bubble up. Um, one of them is sincerity, whole, uh, authentic, trustworthy, wholesome, and cheerful. Uh, Millard Brown just recently did a study of, of brand personality where they rated a whole bunch of brands on brand personality, and they have a, uh, an overall uh, measure of a brand called bonding, how well the brand is bonding with their customers. And um, then they, they looked across 20 countries which personality variable is most associated with bonding. And the number one personality variable was trustworthiness. That was the, the most consistent driver of bonding. It was true in the United States, and it was true in, in almost all of the other 20 countries. Very powerful. Profit has just come out with a, a study of what they call relentless relevance, kind of a study of brand loyalty. And uh, uh, if you look at the top 50 brands out of four or 500, the top 50 brands on that scale, about a th almost a third of them are familiar brands like, uh, like Cheerios, Tide, uh, Band-Aid, Clorox, Folgers. And uh, these are brands that, that don't kind of sparkle. I mean, we're not talking uh, Nikes or Apples or anything. They don't sparkle. And so you think, why on earth are these brands that are really high on loyalty? It's because of, of sincerity. It's because they're authentic, they're wholesome, they're cheerful, they're trustworthy. So this is a very powerful variable, even though it's not very spectacular. Is competence, reliable, intelligent, successful, Microsoft and, and Disney. Um, at the end of the day, you want somebody that's competent, that can deliver. And uh, sophistication, in this elegant, worldly, charming, there's uh, um, Mercedes and Tiffany. And this is a, uh, a personality variable that it kind of explains the high end, how the high end is doing. Ruggedness, strong, independent, outdoorsy, Harley and Land Rover. Um, and excitement, energetic, creative, spirited, up-to-date, dynamic. We have Apple and Nike. Um, a BAV, a Brand Asset Evaluator, is a huge database that YNR has been running for 17, 18 years, every year. It's, it's it's huge, huge, thousands of brands, 30 countries, uh, 80 measures, including they have all of Jennifer's uh, personality scale in there. And, uh, what, and they, they've come out, there's four dimensions of brand that are really important. One of them is differentiation. And, and they analyzed this over time, and they found that brand equity has been declining for 10 or 15 years, it, it, markedly so. Trustworthiness down 23%, even awareness down 35% or something. It's, it's really disturbing and amazing. But the exception are those brands that have energy. They have not declined. In fact, they, this is so important, they've reinterpreted one of their four dimensions. Instead of being differentiation, it's energized uh, differentiation now. So energy is really important. Uh, Jennifer did her study in Japan and Spain, and she found that 
ruggedness didn't emerge. Instead, serenity, serenity emerged. Kind of a commentary on, on lifestyle in, in as well, but uh, serenity is important in Spain and Japan. Now, these big five apply to all products. So, for your brand and your context, you need to decide, okay, that, that gives you a point of departure, but you really need to decide, what is your passion? What is your brand personality? So if you take a brand like Muji, for example, um, it'll, be, it'll have sincerity as part of it and, and um, competence as well, but it also have unpretentious simplicity. It's sort of things functional, simple. Um, it'll be uh, outdoors, love of nature. Muji is a retailer in Japan that has two huge parks. They keep pristine and, and people can use them. And their, their product line is, is very simple. Clothes are beige. All the other things are very simple. Um, they're sort of no, no, the no brand brand. Um, the Sephora is sophistication, all right, but it, it's also got a passion for beauty. They have a website called Beauty Talk. And so that really defines them as a person. Uh, Whole Foods is, uh, uh, if, as a person, is a person that's really passionate about healthy eating and passionate about organic, natural ingredients. So if you think about a person who is really passionate about that, that gives you some, some guidance. So how do you create a, per, a brand personality? And the answer is, anything you do to associate something with a brand will affect its personality. Um, it can be the logo, like the, the, this quirky Google thing. It can be design. It can be uh, a symbol, like the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile truck. It can be a, a, a sponsorship, like uh, Curry, for uh, Under Armour, and um, sort of Curry has a really strong personality. I mean, he's one of the world's nice people, and uh, and he's probably the best basketball player that's that's playing today. And so that says a lot about the personality of Under Armour. Um, the the founder and CEO Michael Dell, the Furrow, which is a content magazine of John Deere. Carrie Atwood, the team, the Luna uh, bike team, Harley Davidson ride plan or a program around the brand. So all those things can drive a personality. So the question is, how many of them are there? How consistent are they? And how strong are they? And, uh, and the really strong brand personalities will have a lot of consistent, strong things going for them. One last thing. I have, uh, in all kinds of forms and books and so on and blogs, I blog at davidocker.com uh, probably around three times a month and I've done about 240 of them now. And, um, and I have a lot of occasion to talk about uh, my brand identity model, which in this book is relabeled as brand vision model because I grew to not like the word identity. Um, so it's a brand vision model. But I, what I always say, or I, I frequently have occasion to say, is that the best brand vision I know of is that developed by Rich and his colleagues here at, ha at Berkeley Haas, and that's the Haas brand vision. So you, I almost think we should do it in unison, right? But <laughs> question the status quo, beyond yourself, student always and confidence without attitude. I mean, the last one is amazing. It is such a differentiator, right? Because we know the, uh, the others <laughs> have a bit of an attitude. Not only the students, but the professors. Whereas we do not, right? 
We have confidence without attitude. Um, and we, uh, I mean, everybody wants to be innovative, right? But we question the status quo. These are all personality variables. I mean, they have substance behind it, but they're personality variables. Confidence without attitude, that's a personality. That's a brand personality. Question the status quo, that's a type of person. It's in a bold idea, is take risks, challenge conventions. That's a, a statement about a person. Beyond yourself, a longer view of decision, ethically, higher purpose. That's a statement about a person. Um, and students audio, curious, lifelong, personal growth. When I've seen a lot of brand visions, and most of them have no brand personality component to them at all. Some have one. But this is, this is brand personality. So when you're doing a brand vision, it's really helpful at some point to say, what about the brand personality? And then some things come out, some things that have to do with energy often. But Berkeley Hawes has really nailed it. We, I tell you, we're really blessed to have Rich as, uh, as a dean. He's a remarkable, remarkable leader and dean. Anyway, that's brand personality. We have some time for some questions if there are some. If you have some questions, uh, please come up to the microphone because we, we are taping these for live also, so we want the sound. Hi, my name is Parag Sampat, second year at Haas. Um, so I had a question regarded to the brand personality for Bath and Body Works. You mentioned that they have a, a personality called Kate, and you mentioned a couple of different values that they ha she has, but I also was thinking that human personalities are very complex, and they have a lot, companies have lots of different types of customers. Do they often come up with multiple personalities, and how do they make decisions when some of those personalities could be competing with one another? That's a really good question. Uh, really good question. Um, one answer is that sometimes you need a different brand vision and personality for different markets. But that's rare, very rare. Uh, usually what you can do is take a certain brand vision and say, okay, when I go to, to China or when I go to uh, the business market, I'm going to interpret one of the the, uh, well, Hawes, Berkeley House calls them principles. I'm going to interpret it differently there than I do here. So I'm going to do the same thing, but it's interpreted differently. And sometimes we say, well, we add something. We add a, 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 a fifth value for some market that needs it. And it won't be inconsistent because the other four are still there, but we just added a fifth. An oil company added in competing in South America. The, the quality that will give you an honest dollar or a gallon of gas if you buy it. We won't cheat you. It turns out in that country that was an uh, important attribute. Um, the other part of the question is that, you know, if you look at, if you do research on brand personality, it's really extraordinary. What you find is the really strong personality brands usually are strong on not one dimension, but two or three or even four dimensions. They're just, it, uh, it, it's kind of a halo effect. You think about the strong personalities in your life. I mean, they have multiple characteristics that make them strong, right? It's not just they're strong on one thing and somebody else is strong on another thing. It's not true. The strong personalities are strong in a lot of dimensions of personality, and the weak ones are strong on none of them. And uh, so almost all strong brands have multiple personality dimensions on which they are strong. Um, and uh, uh, another thing is that, that I was once at a, uh, uh, I, I once got to go to Davos, and I was on a, a, a panel with, uh, 
uh, the Nike CEO. Who's the head of Nike? Phil Knight. Phil Knight, yeah. So anyway, somebody in the audience was challenging him. They said, you're running some ads that are disgusting. They really uh, you know, are, are off-putting. And why, what are you going to do about that? And he, he didn't use these words. And he basically said, look, I don't care what you think. You're not in my target market. My job is to connect with my target market. And I couldn't care less what you think. So I'm going to do nothing but except continue doing this. So um, the point is that you know, if, if you start compromising and say, I, I want to create a brand personality or, or more generally a brand vision that, that works for everybody, you're not going to have a strong brand or a strong connection, probably. So having said all that, it's a really good question and it's, it's, it's difficult. And that's why we people end up paying you the big bucks. If it were, if it were easy, then they wouldn't do that. Hi, my name is Jay Schilling, second year EW MBA. Um, I had a question about consistency with respect to the brain personality, kind of in the same vein that you're talking about. So I saw that you showed the Harley Davidson planner, uh, trip planner. But I mean, if the if the brand identity for Harley Davidson is kind of you know, power, noise, and particularly freedom, you know, how does how does a planner fit into a, you know a brand that kind of says, I'm just going to go out on the road and it takes me where I go. You know. Hmm. I I I don't think that's a problem for Harley Davidson, but I think your general question is is a real challenge, and that is, when do you change? Um, uh, and actually, there's a chapter in the book on answering that question, when you have to, to change. And, and the, the reality is sometimes things change and you have to change. But the reality also is that there's a lot of bias toward change you have to resist. So a new marketing guy comes in and wants to put his plant on it. Or the old marketing guy is there and he's just bored to death with running the same thing for 10 years. And uh, so, he, so he wants to do something fresh and new. Uh, but the reality is the, the, the market has a great proclivity to something they're comfortable with and they're familiar with that's just really powerful. And if something's working, you, you really don't want to change it. And furthermore, you have this risk that whatever you change it to might be terrible, might not work at all. So the, the assumption that you can do better is often faulty or not. So, uh, and if you look at the really strong brands, they don't change. They don't change their position, they don't change their vision. It just, I mean, look, Snoopy's been with MetLife since 1985. Um, what is that, 30 years or something. Um, and can you see them changing that? Uh, and I'm sure over the time there's been some pressure to change it. I mean, I, I was once at Wells Fargo where the B2B guy says, you know, we're selling to sophisticated products to sophisticated people. And the st stagecoach doesn't work. We're, let's dump the stagecoach. Well, saner uh, minds prevailed. <laughs> and they didn't jump, dump the stagecoach. But you know, there's the tendency. Ah, oh, it doesn't. Well, it's not going to work here, and uh, it's old. I'm tired of it, and and it's old-fashioned. It means 200 years ago, and we're today. We want to be modern, contemporary. Stagecoach doesn't work. So um, there are times you have to change, but it, it's much more likely that you end up changing when you shouldn't. Hi, I'm Jeram Basan, second year full-time MBA. On the point of not changing your brand, there are certain overarching themes in the industry, such as corporate social responsibility, being sustainable, and these may counteract with certain brand DNAs that you have. The example that I have in mind is Nespresso, who's a luxury coffee maker that is trying to match the sustainability practices that are continuing in the coffee industry. How do you... Do you ever change for that? How do you incorporate that to your brand DNA? 
Well, I, I uh, gave a talk uh, recently about the three trends in, in, uh, in branding, the future of branding. And uh, so what I said was one trend was this, my mantra, the only way to grow is create new subcategories by must-haves. And uh, a second one is to, uh, instead of talking about your brand, your firm, your offering, you talk about what the customer wants to talk about with, with some real content. Like the furrow I mentioned, John Deere has this magazine they've been putting out for a whole century about farming, good farming, rural lifestyles, and, and not just about tractors, what they make. And, 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 and Sephora has beauty talk. So those are examples of where you, you really have to have content that connects with somebody. And the third uh, trend that I mentioned is the fact that a higher purpose is, is, uh, is really now where it's, it's at. Uh, you know, firms and brands really need a higher purpose. They need it for a lot of reasons. And uh, they need it to keep employees happy, especially younger employees. Millennials just aren't interested in coming to work and putting in the hours and getting the money anymore. They, they really want to be inspired by a higher purpose. And, uh, uh, and, so, and, and companies, it's just amazing how many companies, what percentage of companies have gotten religion and they've created a higher purpose just because it's the right thing to do. And then there's a, a customer block that sometimes maybe only 10 or 15 percent, but 10, 15 percent of the customer base can be the difference between being really profitable and just mediocre. And so customers demand it. So then uh, the challenge becomes what higher purpose? Challenge becomes how can we do something really effective? And the challenge is how can we get credit for it internally and externally? So uh, that's, what, that's what I see, that there's a, uh, uh, a real demand for you know, some authentic, highly, high, higher purpose part of your vision. Um, nice to meet you. And uh, my name is Bruce. And I came from South Korea a few years ago. Uh, first of all, I'm really honored to meet you in person because the, yeah, uh, uh, the 10 years ago when I was the graduate student in Korea, yeah, I've read your article, Brand Extension and Brand Value, or as some other, the Brand Personality. Yeah, I was impressed with you, your research. Uh, so, and now my question is, I'm working for the advertising agency. Uh, my client is a Korean car company. Uh, they are usually pursuing nowadays the, the luxurious. So do you think luxurious could be kind of the brand personality? And also, uh, actually they are not, they seem, they don't, they don't seem to be the luxurious because the Korean car company is just uh, normal and popular. They are not luxurious, but they are pursuing the luxurious. What, what's the name of the brand? Uh, the Hyundai, Hyundai Morris. Hyundai? Yeah. Oh, Hyundai cars. Yeah, oh, so yeah. they are now just the uh, Genesis. Uh -huh. So, but yeah, usually they order me to make their brand more luxurious, even though they don't don't seem to be luxurious. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what could you say to my client? Yeah, <laughs> I want to know about it. Thank you. Oh man, uh, it, uh, Hyundai is one of the big success stories of world branding and world marketing. It's, uh, it's really amazing. And what uh, they did, they didn't create a subcategory. They, they joined the subcategory, which means they got credibility and visibility within a, a subcategory, or more than one, actually. Actually, I've been to Hyundai at, in Seoul. Um, but um, uh, they did that because they had, there were some must-haves that they didn't have. And so they got them. It was amazing. They redesigned the car, made it a, a the fluidic design or something they call it. They, they made the design so it was acceptable. They, uh, they did that, that incredible warranty that 
put substance behind their, uh, their claim this was going to be a reliable car. And uh, uh, they did s three or four things that, that you, you have to do when you are struggling to stay relevant. In their case, they were struggling to get relevant. So they did some amazing things and took a, a brand like this that wasn't regarded highly at all, and they, and they, they went from the people that were willing to consider Hyundai went from 2% to 38% or something like that. I, the numbers aren't exact, but it was amazing. So, um, uh, and, and so if they want to break now into the premium market, uh, even above where they were, is that what the Genesis is trying to do? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't bet against them. Um, it, it, so then they're competing against Lexus and BMW and so on, right? Um, I wouldn't bet against them. And, and, the, and the fact is, even if they don't do too well, it's still going to help the Hyundai brand. It's going to make them more credibility in the, in the sub-premium market. So um, I'm very impressed with Hyundai. I mean, it might be hard for them to accomplish what they, you say they're trying to do, but I, I still. Sorry about this. Uh, hi, my name's Sturgiana, and I'm within the undergraduate program here. And um, I wanted to ask you for your opinion on the emergence of big da data within the field of marketing. So as the field of marketing is evolving, um, most of our recommendations are increasingly getting backed by data. Um, and I wanted to ask, in your opinion, is there ever a time when there's too much data? And can that be contradictory to a brand personality? Yeah. This is the fourth big data era we've had in marketing. The first occurred in the 30s when people first did survey research. And they asked people, what, uh, you know, what do you want in a car and what your image of, of various things? And, it was kind of ad hoc and it really didn't get you much because people fundamentally were unwilling or unable to tell you what they wanted and there was an incredible halo effect. If they liked one dimension, then they liked them all. Um, so the, the 30s, that paved the way for motivation research. That's why motivation research came in. And then in the, in the uh, 60s, we had lifestyle research, which again was quantitative, big data these surveys on, on people's lifestyle. And so now we could see the subconscious in a quantitative way. And uh, that didn't get very far. I mean, so you know 25% of the people like camping. Well, it, it just, it, it, it was hard to translate that into really home run action. Uh, and then we had big data of the 80s. And that came about when scanner data came in. So now we could give people a card and keep track of exactly what they bought. And for some people, it, we actually knew what ads they saw, and we could run experiments on ads. And what people found out is that if you run price promotions, you got a bump in sales. And we modeled that. And so what happened was people started doing price promotions more because then they got a bump in sales, and the data showed it was scientific and very sophisticated models and great data and a whole bunch of data, big data. Brands were destroyed. Kraft was so destroyed, it took them two years, three years to recover. Because what, what this did was teach people, don't buy now, just wait three weeks for the next sale. Buy only on sale. And it also taught them that what's really important in the decision is to what to buy is price. It's not, it's not incidental anymore, it's the whole thing, because that's what people are advertising. That's how people are differentiating themselves. It was, it was a, a branding nightmare. So that, that big data passed, and, we, and people figured out big data and scientific model building is not doing us well. So now we got the fourth generation of big data. And I worry, that, and, and the problem with working with big data is you have people that are sophisticated, 
that, that can understand models, can build the right models, and they get a hold of the right data, but there's, there's so few of those people. And even when they exist, others don't, look, don't listen to them. Because they so want a scientific approach to marketing. Because there's a scientific approach to manufacturing and engineering and you can do ROI analysis and everything. They so want it in marketing too. So you have, and you have a lot of people that are, are not good analysts, or in, that are mediocre or incompetent or, or willing to deceive or willing to not ask the right questions. And, uh, and they build these models and I'm, I'm, I, I warn people Let's not do what we did in the 80s, to let this lead to brand destructive behavior. So anyway, that's my gloomy thought <laughs> for, the, for the day. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm skeptical that big data will be a net help, but I, I, um, there's a, certainly a lot of good social media data and so on, and, and if used right, it can help and be powerful. Okay, last question. Uh, my name is Helen Kiesling. I'm a full-time first year. Um, my question is, do you think the brand personality applies or matters to the same degree in B2B marketing? Yeah, I think it, yeah, it may be even more. Uh, in B2B marketing and in service marketing to some extent, what is much more important are the, uh, are the values of the organization because you're really buying a relationship with an organization usually. And so um, uh, that's, that's less true in packaged goods, for example. So uh, organizational values become really important. And so then you have a brand personality and a brand vision that's around organizational values much more than in other times. But so it, there's a difference in, uh, in, in content and emphasis, but uh, it, it's, it's even more important because in, in, um, uh, in B2B marketing, the brand is carrying a lot of the weight. Even if you have personal relationships, they're creating a brand. Okay, Dave, I, I think we, it was a great pleasure to have Dave talk to us about uh, the, the importance of brand uh, personality and uh, think of brands as with personal relationships. Uh, I think Dave didn't talk about it, but this has been validated with actually a uh, long, uh, long time across many, many brands and, uh, and also with neural measures of brains where people actually behave in this way with these uh, brand personality characteristics. So uh, overall, thank you very much and please join me in thanking Dave. For <laughs>